one has to go back to history and look at the evolution of ocean governance or sea governance. The, we can trace that to the time of Hammurabi, 400 BC, where the first codification ever of a vessel and trade and carriage of goods. Then we have the Romans and the Roman Empire, and they treated the ocean and the sea as a Roman lake, but it was issue of security, the fight against piracy, and the, 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 the Romans' uh, ideas of a, a free uh, sea applied only to Romans. And then, of course, we saw the evolution of uh, and the movement of the power uh, of, the, uh, of the ocean and seas and using the ocean and seas for trade, move to Western Europe, the need for UNCLOS, the UN Convention for the Law of the Sea, was generated by the erosion of the traditional law of the sea because of two impacts. New international actors, because after the Second World War and in 1949 and the institution of the United uh, Nations, many countries, independent countries, have came on the scene and they wanted also to be involved in the management of ocean services and resources. Technologies has transformed traditional uses of the sea in fishing and shipping and introduced a number of new uses. Even seabed mining and ocean energy is, was something that bega they, we began to think about at the time. The diversification in the use, in this kind of use, undermined the traditional order governing the ocean. So no longer viable was a belt of coastal state jurisdiction in territorial sea and the freedom of the seas beyond that. New impacts from urbanization, coastal population, uh, pressures uh, from land-based pollution, atmospheric pollution, pollution from ships, endangered living resources came to, came, became of greater importance. And then something happened that was to change all the old, uh, old paradigm. In 1967, Arvid Pardo, representing the independent state of Malta, which had then joined the group of 77, delivered a historical address to the General Assembly on the 1st of November. He drew the attention of the international community at the General Assembly to the existence of vast resources at the bottom of the deep sea and proposed that these areas, beyond the limits of national jurisdiction, whatever that jurisdiction would be, and their riches, and resources should be declared common heritage of humankind. The moral dimension of governance. He proposed that the area be administered on behalf of humankind by an international authority with benefits to be shared considering particular needs of developing countries and for exclusive peaceful purposes and with due consideration to the environment so as to be preserved for future generations. That is when Elizabeth Mamborgesi became his intellectual partner. And that's when she moved to Malta to create the process to push for the new constitution and the new convention. So two primary forces shaped international ocean law. The, common, the commons nature of the sea, no single nation can exercise exclusive control and the free movement of living resources. And identification of the human pressure due to growing cost of population, technology development, and consumer demand. And so, 
a conference was convened in 1973 to which lasted 10 years almost, in 1982. On 10 December 1982, the conference adopted the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea at Montego Bay. As you see, it took 10 years of negotiations in a new environment, in a new paradigm, with the new actors, and that also is indicative of the complexity of the result and, 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 and the uh, process itself. The UNCLOS entered into force in 16 November 1994, incidentally after the Earth Summit. The UNCLOS did not develop in a vacuum. It paralleled the development of the new international economic order. Because post World War II, there was this decision that we need a new order that would secure peace, a new form of governance that would secure global peace. And UNCLOS was part of that. The concept of sovereign state equality, uh, the concept of respect for common and, and benefit sharing of, from common goods, the establishment of zones to satisfy the needs of, of countries in terms of access to resources, the equitable participation of countries and developing countries particularly, even landlocked countries in the services uh, 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 of the ocean uh, and its resources. All that was part of this new order that UNCLOS what began with, with UNCLOS. It's clear that UNCLOS as a constitution was designed to serve as a unifying framework for a growing number of more detailed international agreements on the marine environment and protection and the conservation and management. But what was the essence, the real essence of the, uh, the, the in, in terms of the governance, was the way that we treated sovereignty in, in, in UNCLOS. UNCLOS transformed, transcended, uh, and limited the concept of sovereignty. The limits to sovereignty by making peaceful settlement of disputes and creating comprehensive dispute settlement, subjecting sovereign rights over resources to duties of conservation, environmental protection, uh, and, and in some cases sharing, imposing a duty to cooperate in the environment, resource management, marine scientific, so it, uh, it limited that. It transformed the sovereignty by disaggregating the concept of abundance of rights, internal waters, territorial sea, 12 nautical miles, contiguous zone, continental shelf. It also transcended sovereignty, the concept of sovereignty through the concept of common heritage of humankind, a concept of non-sovereignty and non-ownership in areas beyond national jurisdiction.